So I could ask if you could stand up. I'm sorry. Okay, if you could just stand up. And I want you to do something for me. Are you ready? With your left hand. Ooh, I did not do that. I'm not in Baltimore here. <laughs> With your left hand. Ready? Just go like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. On this side. Ready? The other hand now. One, two, three, four, five, six. Together. One, two, three. Uh, let's do it again. Ready? Here we go. Ready? Okay, here we go. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, some of you looking at me like, what's with this guy? But I try one more time. Okay, one more time for you guys. Ready? He goes, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, you can sit down. You know, sometimes as a church, you have your leaders that work this way, and then you have others that work this way, Amen. and then when you put it all together, <laughs> it's like different gears, am I right? Well, a lot of our young folks are the same way, because God made them all different. Does that make sense? And so they all have different gifts, different gears, different ways of doing things, and so today at the end when we focus on that, I want us to really think about how we can make it all work out. But before we do that, I do want to have a special prayer. And then also there was a lady that asked if afterwards if she could come forward for a special blessing. Is she back there, Carol? We'll do that at the end. All right? And then if someone, um, there's actually there's an empty seat over here. She wants us to pray for her specifically. After the first message today, she felt that she, it was for her. She needs the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to pray for her. Now, I'm going to be honest, it took a lot of courage to, to admit that. So, sister, i got to give you high five, double high five. Okay? Let us pray. Father, again, as we look at scriptures, we ask again to not only be with us, but again, give us a receptive heart. Not only to read the words, but to see how we could apply them to our lives. Father, we've asked from the beginning that you come and mold us and change us into your image day by day. Do so again. Not only do we give you permission, we invite you to do so. Even though it may hurt the refining process, but we want it to happen because we want to be more like you. Bless us now, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Two things real quickly before we go on to the subject. Sometimes, have you ever just picked up a set of binoculars and you notice it's out of focus? So what's the first thing you do after you pick it up? You have to do what? You got to focus it, right? And so what happens is, before we get into the subject, I need to bring in a little part that we need to focus on. Because otherwise it's not going to make sense, but we could do that in a moment. The second thing is, sometimes through time, words, the meaning of words change. Let me share what happened. Years ago, there was a camp director. He shared this story, and that's how I found out. The father was taking his son to the camp, and I'm laughing over here because you'll see why in a moment. And so they had the camp shirt on, and the son had the camp shirt on, and they went to one of the local stores before they went to the camp. Can somebody give me a bottle of water, please? And so what happened was, in the shirt, it said the name of the camp was Come Be Gay. Now, you heard what the pastor said, right? What? Well, so all of a sudden, what was that you said? That, that was your camp? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. And so the story is, I'm going to ask for two volunteers, okay, real quickly, if you don't mind, when we get to the Bible verses. If not, you can pass it by. There you go. And so what happened was this, so as they share the story with me. They almost got into a fist fight in the local store down the road because somebody started saying, what are you teaching your son? He says, that's the name of the camp. And I have a question for you. Did the name change or the meaning of the word changed? It was the meaning, right? Well, as we read this over here, over the years, we have a Christian word that has changed. And as a result... Today, we need to add a little clarity. 
like with the binoculars. And this is the word. It's called discipleship. Now, do we use it a lot in our church? Or do we use more evangelism sometimes? Think about what I'm saying. And so what I want to do is I want to share with you what the word discipleship meant because that's going to help clarify when we talk about the spirit, okay? So notice this. Sister, what's your name? Joyce. And who has the other microphone? Earl. Earl. So Joyce, if you could please start. From the book of Matthew 28, verse 16 to 20. So I have a question. Does it say go and evangelize? Or does it say go and discipleship? But a lot of times when we want to do efforts, we call it what? Evangelism. But you don't find Jesus ever saying go and evangelize. In fact, I'll give anyone $100 to them if you could show me that. Yet what you will find is Christ constantly saying go and what? Make disciples. So the word is a saying, but what does it really mean? And so what I want to do is I want to give you some quick illustrations, okay? Before we get into the spiritual part, the, the gifts of the Spirit. How many here has ever seen the cry to kid or they're willing to admit it? <laughs> now, there's two different versions, okay? Yeah, the wax on, wax off. The problem is one is actually Kung Fu, the other one is karate. Most people don't know the difference, okay? And so, but either version, the one that you watch, if you notice, you have the master, and then you have the kid that's doing the wax on, wax off, and what is he to the master? He is what? And what does the disciple do? They learn from who? From the master. Am I correct? So years ago when I was actually teaching in the academy in New York City, Greater New York Academy, a young man got up, because, you know, Black History Month in the schools. He goes, I am a follower of Martin Luther King. That's what he said. He says, good for you. So I said, okay, can you give me this date? They don't know the date. Can you give me the name of the speech, where it happened? Couldn't do it. So I started quoting different speeches. He didn't know what part of the speeches were from. And I said, so, my friend, how can you be a follower of Martin Luther King if you don't know anything about him? Am I correct? His teachings, his beliefs, does that make sense? Because a true disciple follows the master's teachings. Am I correct? So I have a question for you. Is evangelism the same thing as discipleship? In the way I'm trying to phrase it now. Because a disciple is a follower of who? For us, is who? Is Jesus Christ. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, I mean, we also follow what? The master. He's not only our savior, he's also our Lord. Does that make sense? So let me share two quick examples of what I mean by the definition of both. Because again, I'm trying to clarify the binoculars before we go into our subject matter. So the first one, if you notice there, I put there the park store. I went to one church, and as I was walking in, the elder stops me. Actually, one of the elders stops me. He says, man, last week I did evangelism. Great. I went to the park, and I talked to this man, and I shared with him that the seventh day is the Sabbath. Isn't that great? I said, excuse me? See, that's evangelism. And so I asked him this one question. At any point of your conversation, did you ever talk to him about Christ? Because what the discipleship does, we talk about who? Christ first, and then the teachings come later. Let me give you one more example, if it's okay. Imagine if I ask Earl to come and eat in my home. So he comes. He sits down at the dining room table, and when he sits down, I says, Earl, excuse me, I gotta go get someone else. And he's sitting there all by himself. And I go and evangelize and I bring someone else in. And then guess what happens? He sits down next to Earl. They don't even know each other. And I say, excuse me, but I need to leave again. So guess what happens? Two strangers, I invited you, but what's going on over here? 
let's change it now to discipleship. Are you ready? I invite Earl. Earl, I want you to come home and eat. By the way, we have a guest coming. So he comes home. I stay there with Earl. See the difference? And we said, I invited Kathy. So Kathy comes. I introduce both of you. Am I there? Mm -hmm. So what is my job as a discipler? Is to make friends with you. Mm -hmm. And what else? Introduce you guys to each other as friends. And together as a team, what are we doing? We're working through different things out in Christian life. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when Jesus says, go and make disciples, that's the harder part. Because it takes time. It takes effort. It takes energy. Evangelism, I just could go do something, and it's very impersonal. Do you see the difference? So now let's go on. Let's talk about the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to see where this part is very important at the end. Whoops, did I just do something wrong here? All righty. Can um, you read for me, please? This is a quote from um, Ellen White from the book Evangelism. Because we have the two extremes. And here's the other extreme, please. Okay, so here's the difference. Evangelism a lot of times pushes for numbers. Discipleship pushes for relationship. See the difference? Now, when I lived in Mexico, I was asked to stay in Mexico to be a pastor there. And I said, I cannot. They go, why? Why not, Carl? We love the way you do things. I said, I cannot. And they go, we don't understand. I says, let me put it this way. In order for you guys to come to the university here, you have to meet a quota of baptisms. Am I correct? Yes. And as a result, how do you push your baptisms? Well, we don't like to talk about that. Well, I do know. You baptize anyone possible, sometimes even the dead, and even children, because why? You want the numbers. This is what happens when you push numbers and not relationship. I said, I can't work for a conference that does that. Does that make sense? I want to take my time to show people Jesus Christ. They make the decision when they want to get baptized. Amen? Amen? It's a little longer, but in the end, those members stay. And so we see the two extremes. But now, I'm going to only go to number three because I already discussed this during the class. So what happens is this. This is part of discipleship. You ask people to come to your events. They come as they are, but God doesn't keep them as they are. They just come. Praise God. So my friend, I'm going to pick on your long hair. How many feet is your hair? Okay, well, you, you got it down to the fourth. <laughs> so I have a friend, came to church, like you, the come level. Should we accept them as they come? Absolutely. Let's invite them, right? But sometimes people, because of the traditions, have issues. Am I correct? I used to go to church with my sneakers. People had issues. I didn't have an issue. <laughs> But I have a question. Should I keep coming? Okay, you have people that go to church without ties, without suits. Should they keep coming? Absolutely. So when I started coming to church, the main reason why I started coming to church, I'm going to be honest, one main reason was to check out the girls. But then I noticed I had to tolerate certain things. They pray all the time. They don't allow me to curse. That's okay. But I still come. And then the last part that I want to go over here before we go into the part of the Holy Spirit is it, there comes a point in every person that as the Lord keeps leading you, because the Bible says, I will draw all men unto me, is where you take the initiative for spiritual growth. And this is the part where we left off last. And this is where I want to come. That happens to every single person. Something happens in our lives where we feel that conviction that we want to repent and be saved. Amen? And so now, let's go back to where we finished off in the last session, okay? So notice what it says over here. Um, if you could read. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. So four things happens when you receive a gift. Now, what is the baseball team of this area? The Braves. What are the colors of the Braves? Right, red, white, and blue. Now, so imagine if I came over here and I had an Atlanta Braves hat, would you automatically think that I'm a fan? <laughs> Be quiet. Now, imagine I had a shirt, you know, one of the jerseys of the Atlanta Braves has with that cap. Would you think I'm really more into it? Now, what happened if I had a keychain that said Atlanta Braves? And then in my car, you see the logo that says Atlanta Braves. After a while, you would know, what is my team? The Atlanta Braves. Am I correct? Well, in the Bible, something happens when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we repent, we get baptized, and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. One of the things that happens is, you know what? We become part of a team. And that team is called God's team. And so notice what it says in scriptures. If you could read, please. Now it is God who makes both us and we stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Okay, so notice he put a seal of what? So who do we belong, we belong to? What team do we belong to? So imagine every person, once they get baptized, they realize, I am not a wanderer anymore. I belong to one team, and that team is God's team, and I wear his jersey. Praise God. Amen. And when the angels look at you and I, even though you and I may not see the jersey, they see the jersey, and they go, that person, that person, that person belongs to God. Praise God. Amen. So that's the first wonderful thing that happens. But the second thing is this, and this for me gives me a lot of hope. Whose turn is it? Is it yours? Okay, there we go. Earl. <laughs> Amen. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Okay, there goes that word again, promise, right? It was promise, gift, power. Go ahead. Who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. Amen. Can you also read this one, please? I got a question for you, Earl. Ready? Do you have a will? I'll put you on the spot. I'm sorry. Okay, I have a will. Now, I have a question. Do most people know what's in that will? No. Well, in your case, you probably said yes because I want to put my name on it, right? But most people, they don't know what's in the will. Am I correct? They will know when I watch. When I die, unless it's a living will, okay? So I don't want to get it too technical over here for the lawyers that may be here. Okay, so usually people know the content of the will when I die. Now, this inheritance guaranteed is different. It's an open will. God already told us the contents of the will. Isn't that beautiful? He's telling us that when we die or if we live, it doesn't matter. We have a guaranteed salvation. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, isn't this wonderful? So two things happen. The first one is we become part of God's team. He owns us. We're part of his team. The second one, we have a promised will. That no matter what happens, if we're alive or dead, when he comes, we have automatic salvation. Isn't that wonderful? Now, some people struggle with that. But according to the scripture, I can walk out of that. I can say, God, take me out of the will, but that's my choice. But when I get baptized and I receive the gift of the Spirit, this is one of the promises as we read. Praise God. Amen. Well, let's go to the third one over here. And then I want to share a story about my life. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. Amen. I will give Okay, stop right here. I will give you what? A new what? Of that. Go ahead, please. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my law. 
So the third promise. God puts his spirit in me to keep what? To be obedient to him. I can't do it on my own. Isn't that what you said the other day? Until I submit, right? Or was it today? <laughs> All right, thank you, brother. When I first started, when I joined the Adventist church, not as a baptized member, but coming to church, came as a teenager. And teenagers, I don't know if you know this, but if you forgot, I'm going to remind you. Teenage boys, when a new teenager comes into the herd, they want to size him up. They want to know where in the pecking order he's going to be. You guys know that? Now I got a question. Do the girls do the same thing? And I, well, you know what? You guys admitted it. Thank you. <laughs> and so as a teenage boy, I come into a church with a lot of teenage boys. And so they want to know where in the pecking order Carl is going to be. And so as I joined that church, something happened. The church actually burned down. <laughs> Not before me. <laughs> Earl, bad thoughts. <laughs> so the church burned down. But this is what happened. When the firemen came and they hosed the church down, right? In the middle of the church, in the center, there was a Bible. All around it was burnt, cinch, and the Bible was not touched. But all the water and the fire was not touched. And so the pastor took that as a meaning that from this point forward, we could establish this church in God's word. And he made the call. Now, I just came into the church brand new. Okay, I was a punk. He says, Carl, you're going to help us rebuild this church. Okay, well, what is it you want me to do? Well, you see that brick board behind the sanctuary? So it was like a, all this was bricks all the way up. He says, your job is to hose it, paint it. So it could look fresh. So guess what I did? My job was to paint it. So they put the scaffolds and I painted everything red. And then in between, <laughs> it took forever, I painted the gray lines because it was, it was really you know, bad. So that was my job. And I did it by myself. But what happened is the other teenagers did not realize that the old Carl still was in my heart. In other words, I still had a temper. And so what happened is these kids are coming in from their whatever jobs the pastors gave them because the pastor is the one that taught me, put the kids to work, give them opportunities. And so some of these kids are walking in, and they start talking about my twin brother, Angel, that he looks like a monkey. And, you know, I took it. So that means if he looks like a monkey, what do I look like? That was fine. Then they started talking about my father. And they said some nasty stuff. I also took it. But then they talked about my mother. Now, for those that know anything, if you don't know anything about the Latino culture, the something you never talk about, never, is your mama. Am I right? Okay, can you raise your hand so everybody can see like it? Am I right? Never talk about mama. So they're talking about my mama. So I got off the scaffold. Remember, I didn't have the new heart yet. The spirit was working there. And I went to the guy and I says, can you repeat what you said? Your mama, that's all he said. He was on the floor, knocked him out. Big black eye. And the other teenagers are all backed away. And I says, do me a favor, when he wakes up, if he wants the other one, tell him to talk about my mama again. And I went to the scaff when I started painting. But what they did not see is what I want to share with you. I was crying. I was crying. Now why? Because here I am, I so desperately want to be a Christian. Desperately. And I realize there's two challenges. People will always challenge you. <laughs> always. And the other one is, am I going to allow them to dictate my faith? You know what I'm saying? And I'm praying, Lord, I have a temper issue. And I used to fight in the martial arts. So I know how to hit people to make them pay for it. I need your help here. And I remember praying, God, I need your spirit. Put a new heart in me and change me. Is this a promise? It is. And so one of the beautiful things about when we get baptized and repent, we receive the gift of the spirit, is we have also a promise that he will give us a new heart 
and put a new spirit in us. And I will remove from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. This is a promise from God. I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. That was the last day I ever hit anyone. <laughs> and to this day, I'm happy. Now, I'm going to be honest. There's come a few closer calls where I joke about the slapping oil. Okay, where I really want to slap someone hard. I'm going to be honest. But I says, Lord, may your spirit keep molding me. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm going to grow in your perfection. Does that make sense? So we have three promises. I want to get to the last one. And this is where the discipleship comes in. What was the first one? I'm repeating it for you guys to remember. What was the first one? I, I am owned by who? By God. What's the second one? Hopefully you wrote it down. What is it? I am what? I have inheritance. I'm sealed, right? And the third one, it gives me a new heart. Now here's the last one. Whose turn is it again? Earl? Thank you. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another, Now, now take your time on the last verse, please. Thank you, Earl. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. Okay, so who gives all these gifts? It's the Spirit. So part of the promise, he's going to give us a gift. Part of the promise, he's going to give us the power to use that gift. And then if you could read on, please. And he gives them to each one just as he determines. Who determines the gift? It is God. So my pastor, before I got baptized, he says, Carl, there's one word that I want you to learn. And my pastor was slick. From the church to our camp was about an hour to an hour and a half. He says, Carl, I need you to come with me to camp. So guess what? He knew that he had me for three hours. He was slick. And so he taught me at that point, he says, Carl, when you get baptized, there's one word I want you to learn. And that word is the word No. He says, it's the same thing in English and Spanish, so don't confuse it. <laughs> okay? He says, but now there's another word I want you to remember, because I was relearning Spanish. He said, the word is si, S-I. Si means yes. And I said, what do you mean, Pastor? He says, God has revealed to me that he has called you to work with young people. I went, what? <laughs> no! I hated kids. You look at me like, What? Hey, I went to a Catholic church. If anybody starts talking to church, you can hear a pin drop, right? And if anybody, you know what I'm talking about, sister, right? And if you got people yapping, yapping, everybody looks at you. And you feel the pressure, right? And guess what starts happening? You stop talking. So I joined the Adventist church, a Spanish Adventist church, with kids. <laughs> and I don't know how many times I'm going to stand up in the middle of the sermon, shut up! And the kids were the worst. So I was saying to the pastor, you've got to be kidding me. No. He says, no, that's what it is. I said, okay. I don't know how this is going to turn out. He says, but when the nominating committee comes, which, remember, that's not always from the Lord. He says, you have to say no to whatever is not your calling. So I came back. I was frustrated. I was angry with God. After I got baptized, here's the funny thing. When I heard the kids talking in church, I understood. A lot of these babies were just trying to imitate what we do. I said, oh, it's so cute. What's wrong with you, Carl? Who changed me? It's the Holy Spirit. So the nominated committee came to me and says, Carl, you're an educator. You have a, a degree. We want you to be the, the teacher for the Sabbath school for the adults. 
So guess what my word was? No. Yeah, but hold it. We're the nominated committee, but we prayed. No. Yeah, but you know, we took time and we really thought about this carefully and we really want you to consider this and say yes. No. But why are you saying no? Because the pastor told me to say no. <laughs> so I want to talk to the pastor. And the pastor says, you're not asking him to do what God has gifted him for. So they came back and says, can you be the junior division Sabbath school leader or teacher? Yes. Can you help out with Pathfinders? Yes. That was my introduction. Who gives us the gifts? It's the Spirit. And I have a question. Can God give us more gifts? Like the parable, the parable of the talents? If we use them, can he give us more talents? So as I close, I want to share this story of my aunt. Who actually, how do you call it? Lady married my uncle. My what? Okay, but it's not, okay, either way, aunt. Okay. In my family, we have Pentecostal, Presbyterian, and Adventist pastors. Now, she was called to be a pastor. Now, this is, I'm not talking about women's ordination, so don't beat me up here. Okay. In the Pentecostal church, you have a lot of female pastors. In my family, a lot of women pastors. I'm used to that. And so this woman married my uncle. Now, the thing is, for those that may not know, you know, I'm one of the darkest in my family. So they call me negrito. You know what that means? In Spanish, it's not a bad word, but in English, if I say my negro, people are like, what? But in Spanish, it's a word of endearment. Am I right? Mi negrito. And so she married my uncle, but she's not Spanish. She makes you look dark. She is lily white. <laughs> okay? And she said, the Lord has impressed me to go work in the South Bronx, in the Spanish neighborhood, and my husband, he's been convicted of that too. So guess where she went to start a ministry? In the South Bronx, South Bronx, as an American woman. Guess who stuck out like the rice among all the beans? <laughs> Pretty obvious, right? A year later, it is our tradition that if someone in our family dies, all the pastors get together, we part of the service. They give us different parts. So as I arrived there, she was there, she was giving a 10-minute talk. And I really thought, no joke, <laughs> that she was lip-syncing. That she, she had somebody record the whole message in Spanish. Because she didn't know one word of Spanish. Si, no, no, not even yo quiero taco bell. Okay? Zito, Zippo, okay? And so I'm hearing this woman. I said, okay, where's the recording? So I'm looking around the pulpit to look for the recording. It was her. Perfect Spanish without an accent. Perfecto Español. So I asked her this question. What happened? This is what she told me. Carl, out of all people, you know better. Who gave me the gift to preach? Who's the one that gave me the gift of tongues? I asked God to give it to me if he's going to put me in a Spanish neighborhood. It doesn't make any sense. I'm going to go to a Spanish neighborhood and I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> Am I right? I could not believe it. But all I could do afterwards is stay there and praise you, God. So let's summarize as we close. And I'm going to ask um, Carol to start coming forward. So what is discipleship? is when we take our time to mentor our young people to fall in love with Jesus. Does that make sense? I'm not preaching to them, even though that's part of it. It's the whole package deal. And then once they get baptized, there's four things that happen that we have to remind our young people. What is the first one? That they belong to a team, the team of Jesus Christ. The second thing is that God wrote them a will, and he already told them the content of that will. Isn't that beautiful? That if you live or die until the Lord comes, it doesn't matter. Your salvation is in his hands, is guaranteed. Praise God. The third thing, he says he's promised to give us a new heart and a new spirit. Why? To mold us, to move us, to follow him. Isn't that beautiful? Because I'm going to be honest, on my own, there was no way I could control my temper. But under God, 
He molded me. And then the last thing is he gives us all gifts for service. He doesn't want us to hide them in the ground like the parable of the talents. He wants us to use them and let it multiply so we could be a blessing to humanity. And as we use them, guess what he does? If we keep asking for more, he gives us more. Isn't that beautiful? So here's my question for you before she comes up. Do you know what your gift is? If you don't, I want to pray for you. That God will reveal it. And usually your gift is something that comes easy to you. In my case, God told the pastor, and then it was confirmed afterwards. So I was a weirdo on that one. But for a lot of people, they don't know what their gifts are. But I want to pray that God will show you. And that you will help these kids discover what their gifts are also. So this way they can use it to forward the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, while I'm praying afterwards, Carol, if you could just sit over here. And then I could ask the pastor afterwards if we could pray for her. I got to come down. Let us pray. Father, thank you again for the simplicity of Scripture. Thank you again for the stories and the promises that it gives us and helps us to understand that we can walk around with a surety of our salvation, knowing that we belong to your team, knowing that you are doing everything to mold us if we allow you. And finally, that you've given us gifts for ministry. And Lord, if for some reason, someone here today, they don't really know what the gifts are. Father, one way or other, speak to them. Show them. So this way they could use it to glorify your name and help others come to the knowledge of your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.